Hi, my name is Katja Poppenheger, and I would like you to know if you care about exoplanet atmospheres, and especially if you care about infrared helium observations of atmospheres, then you really also need to care about stellar coronal abundances. And the reason for that is that it's the stellar coronal iron lines that are in a large part responsible for putting the helium in the exoplanet atmosphere into the correct excitation state to be observable. So if you want your helium observations to be a success, pick a star with strong coronal iron lines. And for more, check out my poster. Hello, my name is Joe Callingham. I'm going to talk to you about radio stars and exoplanets at low frequencies. What can a low frequency detection of a stellar system tell us? Well, it can give us a direct measurement of the magnetic field strength of the potential radio emitting star or exoplanet as modeled off the Jupiter Io system, where Io is driving these beautiful aurorae on Jupiter. We've used the Dutch radio telescope called LOFAR to try and find these systems outside our, our, our solar system because it's so sensitive. And this is our first detection of GJ1151, an M dwarf system, which you can see appear on the left and disappear on the right between two different epochs. After modeling the radio emission, we found the best model that could fit is a scaled up Jupiter Io system where we replace Jupiter with the star and Io with the potential putative uh, exoplanet uh, of about an Earth size in a one to five day orbit. And uh, interestingly, the Habitable Planet Finding team recently detected an RV signal from this star of a roughly Earth-sized planet in a two-day orbit. And so to conclude, we think we're seeing the first detections of star-planet interactions at low frequencies. Hi, I'm Adam Germain, and I want to tell you about tides, differential rotation, and eclipsing binaries. We know from helioseismic observations that stars can have persistent, large-scale differential rotation. This differential rotation means that when a binary tidally synchronizes, it isn't the surface that synchronizes to the orbital period, but somewhere deeper in the star. And so the surface period may not equal the orbital period. We think this may have been seen in a population of solar-like Kepler eclipsing binaries. And we combined these observations together with tidal theory to infer constraints on the differential rotation of sun-like stars. What we see is that these stars have much less shear than the sun which we think is because they're on average much more rapid rotators. Um, for more, please see our paper, Jermaine, Tyre, and Fuller, 2020. The archive number is on the slide. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Morgan Deal. I would like to present our recent work on lithium abundant dispersion in metal pole stars. Many population two stars show similar lithium abundance, the so-called lithium plateau. But many metal pole stars also present a large scatter. In this work, we focused on carbon-enhanced metal pole stars. These stars are believed to be formed by the accretion of the wind of a companion going through the AGB phase. We computed population 2 solar models with the Montreal Montpellier evolution code, including this effect of accretion. We included atomic diffusion and we especially studied the impact of thermoaline convection triggered by the unstable mean molecular weight gradient constructed by accretion using a recent prescription. This instability is known to induce lithium depletion. We show that lithium dispersion can be explained by the accretion of matter starting from an initial primordial lithium. If you want more details, please check our poster. Thank you for your attention. In Morella Naylor 2019, we introduced a new technique for measuring a star's radius using only geometric distances and multiband photometry. The shape of the spectral energy distribution determines the SED temperature and the flux beneath it the luminosity. We produced a catalogue of radius measurements for over 15,000 low mass stars. From this, we were able to derive the temperature radius and luminosity radius relationships for main sequence M dwarfs. Our work then investigated the apparent 3-7% spread in radius for main sequence M dwarfs. The conclusion of these studies was that stellar magnetism was not the cause of radius inflation on the main sequence, with the spread instead being caused by fitting a distribution of metallicities with only solar metallicity models. However, our method is able to measure luminosity regardless of this, enabling us to mitigate against this with precise measurements of metallicity. Removing this spread, we find that M dwarfs sit on a tight sequence with a 1-2% to intrinsic spread. See these results in detail in our publications. Hey everyone, my name is Oliver Hall, and my haiku is Rotation slows less on late main sequence than thought, seen through vibrations. Stars on the main sequence lose angular momentum as they age, and the rate at which they lose angular momentum is tied to their colour. So if you know a star's colour and its rotation rate, you know its age. However, this so-called gyrochronology relation seems to break down past the middle of the main sequence age. Um, this has been seen using rotation rates from spots in field stars. We have confirmed this so-called weaker magnetic breaking effect 
using new independent astroseismic rotation measurements. So these are measures of rotation that have been obtained using the oscillations of stars. We compared, compared these new rotation rates to a standard evolution scenario and one where weak magnetic breaking takes place and found that overwhelmingly the latter is preferred. So these older stars slow down less rapidly and so rotate faster at older ages than we expect. If you're interested in this topic, please come and chat to me or check out my poster. Have a good day, cheers. Hello everyone, I am Eliana Maso. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the IP Institute in Potsdam. And this is the analysis of simultaneous observations of the Young Song Iota Horology. That is a star with one of the shortest X-ray cycles and a long-term following up in spectroscopic data. From the Far Beyond the Sun campaign, we obtained around six semesters uh, of observations with Hartz Paul. Also, we got two uh, observations using HST and we complemented our analysis using test photometry. With that photometry and a GPS method that uh, is available in Shapiro et al. 2020, we analyzed the facular to spot ratio of the star. And this analysis told us that the star is spot dominated in its surface. We also uh, cross correlate the multiple uh, observations uh, and we were able to recover S index, H alpha, also radial velocities, and to compare the photometric uh, analysis with the Siemens Doppler imaging of the star. With the HST data, we were also able to recover some diagnostics from the transition region in the corona. And stay tuned for our forthcoming publication and stay safe at home. See you. Hello. I am Diego Godoy Rivera from The Ohio State University. Stellar rotation is a fundamental property of stars, and many of the constraints that we have for rotation come from open clusters. Unfortunately, the memberships of these systems are often heavily contaminated by field stars. In this work, we revise the rotational sequences of a sample of open clusters by using the Gaia data to identify the probable cluster members in astrometric phase space. This is illustrated in figure one, where we show the probable cluster members in blue. We then use this to remove the non-member contamination from the rotational sequences of the clusters. This is illustrated in figure two in the period versus temperature diagrams. We do this for all the clusters in our sample and produce revised rotational sequences. These are summarized in figure three, shown as median rotation period as a function of mass and age. For more information, please check out my poster as well as my recent paper with Mark Pinsonal and Luis Arrebol. Thank you for your attention.